Welcome to the You Can Man podcast, episode 27. I'm Josh. I'm Tim. And I'm Dave. And on this week's episode, The Great Outdoors. Hi, right, guys. Welcome back to the You Can Man podcast, where we believe what one man can do, you can do as well. This week, we're going to be talking about the great outdoors, camping and the like. But first, how was your week, guys? Josh, you had a you had some stuff you wanted to say. Uh, yeah, I had a I had a big big week, big weekend. I ran my first half marathon. That's right. Whoa. Yeah, been training this my whole life. Just kidding. Um, I didn't see the thirteen point one sticker on your car. I know yet. they didn't give it to me. I thought I would get one at the finish line so that I could put it on the Lexus, but nope. You'll have to wait for the sticker. But. Yeah, ran ran a half marathon. Good for so you. Like half of something really hard. All right. We're all proud of you. Yeah. Okay, we get it. Half You're of amazing. something. I cannot yeah. imagine doing that. My wife's done it, I think, twice. I'm she has the sticker, impressed. doesn't she? It, you know, it's it funny. <laughs> it was on the van when we bought it. And so <laughs> oh, she's like, really? oh, it's staying. <laughs> And now I feel That's weird good. every time I drive it. Cause yeah, because you are a People pass up. me and they're like, uh-uh. So he's not running no anything. <laughs> well, this was a weird half marathon, right? Because it was at night. Yeah, it started at 7 p.m. This particular night in Roswell, Georgia, it was still 92 degrees at race time. Perfect conditions. Right by the river, which means flat mostly, uh, humid as well. So uh, made a lot of mistakes, made the biggest rookie error of starting with a pace that was much too fast Whoa. for me to sustain. So halfway through the race, my body said, we are done. <laughs> so then I just willed myself uh, the remainder of the race. Oh, that's bad It was terrible. It's yeah. not it, enjoyable. I mean, it had to have been a, a pretty run. Uh, a scenic run is what I mean. Yeah, for for I those of know. you that don't, <laughs> don't live in the Atlanta area, Roswell is a suburb of Atlanta. And Josh is saying he was running along the Chattahoochee River. Yes. It's, it's very pretty down there. Yeah, it really is. There's a national forest that kind of runs that corridor. And so. Yeah, yeah the first um, three miles were nice. It's um, nice because it's not it's not a crowded race, right? Like it's pretty. It was pretty crowded. Oh, was it? Yep. Yeah, uh, wow. I don't know how many half marathoners were there, but I mean, it was like over 500 like okay. half marathoners. I think there were like 2,000 in the whole. There was a 5K as well. But uh, yeah, it was nice on the front end. And then the rest of it, I was fighting for my life. So I didn't know. And then it got dark, uh, like two hours. It gets really dark, doesn't yeah, it? Like it there's not a lot of light. By not. the river. They don't have a lot of street lights because yeah. they like to keep it natural. So that, I mean, they everybody was supposed to have a headlamp. So I had my headlamp and... It got real, but uh, I finished, but I'm definitely doing another one because I'm embarrassed at my effort because I made a huge rookie mistake. That's too so. bad. I keep talking like I've done that race. I haven't. I've been to that race because I was cheering my wife on. Mm, okay. I registered for it, didn't run it. So both of your wives have done half marathons. Yeah, I, I've never, you know, I've run off and on my whole adult life and I've, I've never been into anything like i'm just not interested in anything past a 10k yeah i've I've, uh, I've been working up to it but after running the half which i know in the world of athletic prowess is almost a nothing i uh, don't know about that there's like people that do iron mans and i'm like this the iron man what i just did is the running part of the iron man a half on, a half iron man a ma- an iron man is a full marathon do we need to look that up? It's, I can 1,000% okay. promise you. I feel like it probably is a full so, marathon. And yeah, anyway, but, there's Iron Man things that are like even light years beyond what I've done. So anybody that says they ran a half marathon, they've run a half marathon, I, I'm i impressed. Yeah. And not not in myself. It's no small feat. Not an embarrassing effort. But um, yeah, it's tough. It's really tough. A lot of people out there getting after well, it. Well, I was going to say, just get back on that horse, buddy. Yeah, I am. It, it was. This will not be my last one. Um, so yeah, that's, that's pretty much the big, that was the big thing that happened over the weekend. All right, Dave, any, any, anything exciting happening with you? I would no nothing, nothing exciting at all, but I was reminded, I just watched this documentary on this guy. He did a not. So for those of you that don't know, I'm going to get the, all the distances wrong, except for the run, but an Ironman is, so it's a swim bike or swim bike run. And it's like two point something mile swim, 112 mile bike. Then a marathon, right? That's an Ironman. This guy did an Ironman. I got to get this right. Did he do 50 over 50 days? He called it the 50-50-50. It was an Ironman every day in every state. 
for 50 days. Consecutive days? Every single day he did an Iron Man. No. It, yes, I watched the I watched the it was documentary. On Netflix, right? It was crazy. It was it was unreal. Every day. Every single day. He started in Hawaii, then flew to Alaska the next day, did another one. Now, I was thinking, how did he enter that many races and there are that many he didn't do they weren't all he just did the distances on his own. Gosh. Um, it was pretty insane. He finished it. I maintained throughout the documentary that it took like 12 years off his life, but <laughs> yeah, there are some crazy that's people not, out that's there. That's not man. healthy. It's not, it is certainly is not healthy. Yeah. I've heard uh, science and there's a lot of science out there, but I've heard like past the half marathon, you're getting like diminishing returns. Like yeah. after that, it's just like how your body, how far not, can you physically push yourself? It's right. not like you're getting this huge uh, benefit from it as far as, um, well, we would all know because we're in peak physical condition. Yeah, obviously. I was about uh-huh. to mention that. But yeah, so one other thing um, I was going to mention related to our um, podcast on uh, do you really need a new car? I think that was um, the episode. Two, two episodes ago. Two, two episodes ago. Uh, I mentioned that there was a question on when was the first year of the Honda Odyssey. Yeah, I asked that. And like I just randomly threw out 93 because it felt good. It was 94. So mm. hey, I wanted to brag and say I was wrong, but I was within one year. Yeah. So you that, can't that ever just my, say I was wrong, can you? No, I have to, I have to couch <laughs> it in this like I was super close. Uh, one more thing from that podcast. Dave said, like, with authority. Oh, and I'm not no. calling you out. I'm not calling you out. Oh, but you are. I'm not. I'm going to add to. Okay. You said... At dealerships, like even like you were talking about good dealerships, which debatable if they exist. You said they are not trying to take advantage of you. I, I don't know why I would have said that. I don't know why I would have. You I said think it I was trying. I think I was trying to be PC because they're always are, trying to take you advantage are, yeah, of you. You are. So I wanted. I just wanted to add to that and said they are trying to take advantage of you. Now there may be some some dealerships out there that really are really care about their customer. No, nope. they, they want to get as much money from you as possible, right? Well, yeah. that's what he said. He clarified it. Now, whether or not he you think that's one in, the, one in the same as taking advantage. Yeah, taking advantage of, to me, is having way more knowledge than the person you're dealing with and and not being a consultant. Like, if they really cared about you, they'd have this, like, super c- consultative <laughs> approach with you. Um, to get you into something that is really going to benefit you a lot. That certainly hasn't. I've never experienced that. Um, I've bought many cars. Yeah. And, so I, I just feel like always have your guard up because, you know, that you mentioned it a couple times and said it very clearly. They're not trying to take advantage of you. I think we all, we need to keep our guard up. Um, I think I was being too nice. I had a friend, OK, that I used to work with and he was a former car salesman. And I, I think the reason maybe that that was in my mind was I said to him one time, I was like, hey, man. I don't remember exactly what I asked him, but it was essentially, are they always trying to like, you know, get the one up on you? And he's like, they're really not like they're not not they're not very few of them are like that. That is totally not true. OK, I'm calling him out. I'm not going to say his name, but in my experience, they're always trying to just like siphon money out of your wallet. Yeah. Here's the problem. There are there are certain dealerships that advertise on the radio like we have a we have a local talk radio station that's like the hugest one everyone knows it uh there are dealerships that advertise on there and the sports talk stations as well this is probably more of the sports talk station thing but the dealer will get on there in the mornings and brag it's a duo male and female brag about how they got somebody into a 2018 honda odyssey with a 540 credit score. Every deal is and different. Yeah. They always and, make that qualification. Like, I'm like, look, if you're getting in, if you're getting somebody with a 540, I'm not making blanket statements. I'm just saying typically, if you're getting somebody into a twenty-five thousand dollar vehicle with a 540 credit score and you're financing for them, you are making tons of money off of them. And yeah. they are getting put in a tight spot. There's these deal these dealers go, they're well known dealerships that, you know, are have the customer's best interest in mind. So you're just saying there, about there that. could be like predatory lending type situations going on. Oh, yeah. What we're saying is do your homework. OK, take somebody with you. If you're if you're not comfortable, take somebody with you who knows uh, who has a little bit of knowledge and just do your homework so that you're not taking advantage. Yeah. Of. So okay, we'll move so, on. So clearly yep. we need to do another episode down the road 
about just buying cars. Part yes, two. Okay. Because we we're, we're taking up too much time we with, uh, with this. But hey, I appreciate that. Let's move on. Okay. So the topic at hand today, the great outdoors. We've been talking about doing this type of episode for a while now. It kind of centered really around camping because camping has been a large part of our lives for seriously we've been camping together of our friendship yeah yes for like 20 plus years That's decades wild. we're old it's weird. it started in the latter part of high school i guess when we were juniors and seniors yep. i don't know maybe, maybe we went when we were sophomores probably not i, I, I guess drive. we had to, yeah we had to, yeah, yeah we <laughs> had to drive but yeah it's been a huge part of our of our lives and so spending time outdoors has uh been a real opportunity to shape our friendship and it's cheesy as it's a, sounds, it's a sacred event okay yeah it's it's, just, it's it's a thing that guys do and girls but men especially that you know we really enjoy doing that and so there's lots of reasons there's lots of benefits just to simply being outside amen so we wanted to take some time and talk about this topic and just go over some of the benefits. And just to remind you, if you're in a if you're in that stage of life and you got the office job and you haven't really done a good job of being outside a whole lot, or maybe you've just never really been an outdoors type guy before, I'm telling you, it's so worth doing. Yeah, I want to. I have my first note on on my sheet here for for me to mention is that that like office lifestyle thing, uh, air conditioning. Like it always, especially this time of year, because we are. It is August. We are in Georgia. Um, we are in. You know, it's a super hot place. It's humid. It's brutal outside. Very uncomfortable. The past few weeks, especially here, have just been crazy. You know. Low mid nineties, crazy humidity, unbearable. But I always think about, man, just in the seventies, only ten percent of the houses in the seventies had like central air. If you go back to the sixties, like not many people had air. Yeah, if you're going all. back before the nineteen fifties, you were opening the windows. Yeah, so, but straight people up. lived in this, and that like it was part of their lives, and they dressed way nicer with like more long sleeves and long pants and jackets than we did and they survived and yeah like everyone was like sweaty but they were also like not morbidly obese all of them uh and so i always uh, it's always a trade-off because like ac super nice like you love it you get in your car after being outside it's nice you go into a building i mean some of us can go from our car to our or from our house to our garage to our car turn the air on drive to a parking deck park, walk into our office building and never have to even like deal with the heat if we don't want to. Yeah. And let me go ahead and just tag on to that and say that that's the way that it should be. Okay. <laughs> it, living in Georgia in August, air conditioning is a requirement, but, <laughs> but I think we are, we were made to be outside. Like that's our natural yes. habitat. Okay. So I'll take the AC, uh, you know, 90% of the time in, in July and August, but for the remainder of the year, you need to get outside. I know that it's when I'm not hurting you when I'm stuck, when I'm stuck in, in the office, you know, all week, I, like my body is just like, oh, I got to get outside. You know what I mean? Like we're just we're made to be out there. Yes. Yeah. And so my number one reason and hopefully I won't be able to hopefully I won't butcher this description. I probably will. But for me, we'll be, let you know. yeah, being outside and enjoying nature is connecting with my creator. So we are all Christian guys. You may I don't know how much we've gone into it in the past, but being out in nature and experiencing God's creation is one of the major, if not the reason, period, that I really enjoy the outdoors. Uh, it, I mean, I could go on and on about how Scripture talks about God's creation and seeing his character in part, obviously, through nature. And so for me and for these guys too, Josh and Dave, <clears throat> that's one of the huge reasons why we love the outdoors and is it's such a benefit to us. Being outside and seeing that is experiencing in part him. All things were made through him. And so we, we believe that. And so that's why being in the outdoors is such a uh, huge part of our lives. Uh, I have a list of a bunch of medical benefits. Get to the science. Yeah, that 
being outdoors. So there's tons. Did you rip these straight from like WebMD? From basically one article. <laughs> okay. Uh, and I will post the link to that article. So I did some quick research. I'm sure there's tons of other articles out there. I think I got this one from Business Insider. So I was like, it's got to be, it's got to be sem- semi, uh, you know, reliable. It's reputable. All right. So let's get into it here. There's several studies that show that nature walks, just walking in nature, whether that be the forest, whatever, actually has memory promoting effects that other walks don't. So like walking in the city hmm. or something like oh, that. Oh, yeah. Interesting. There's, not, there's nothing bad about it. Yeah. If you have allergies or whatever, like that's, you know, that's <laughs> uncomfortable, but there's nothing bad about being I think there. that all of these were going to say, oh, well, yeah, duh. But it's kind of one of those things where you're like, but why? Yeah, you know what's interesting, and I don't know, I haven't done a like city walk or run comparison to nature walk or run, but I used to go to the local um, Kennesaw Mountain, which actually my family and I went there tonight or earlier this evening. Uh, Beautiful park, lots of nature trails. I used to run there super regularly because I lived right by it. I, I would listen to podcasts and... While I would run. And then later, if I listened, if I heard that same clip from the podcast, I could literally put myself, I could envision the path I was on when I heard that part of the podcast. Like really weird recall stuff. I haven't huh. done it like a city comparison. Or yeah, like, you'd have to do the comparison to see. Yeah, but I don't know. Anyway, that nature thing, that plays with There's me. something to I'm it. good with it. Yeah, and so also being outdoors um, has demonstrated a de-stressing effect. Yes. Okay? <laughs> and again, this is one of these duh kind of things. But they actually tested and it lowers your levels of cortisol. I was going to say is, cortisol. Yeah. I was straight up going to say that. Which is used as one of the stress markers, mm-hmm. right? So they tested people and they had less levels of cortisol. I think I was going to say cortisone, but yeah, totally cortisol. <laughs> well, yeah, I've, I've read, and again, we're not experts. Um, we just play one on a podcast. But anytime I hear, you know, uh, someone giving advice to like people that may be depressed, I mean, I've, I've heard clinical psychologists talk about this, that like one of the first things they say is, like get out and move, like get outside and go for a walk or go for a jog. Just get, get yourself moving outdoors. Uh, and that's kind of like level one of treatment for a lot of depression. Yeah. You got to get that, that energy out of your body. Right. I've heard, I can't take credit for this. I think I heard Joe Rogan say it, that the body is like, it's like a battery. Okay. And if you don't release that energy, like a battery, if you just let it sit there, it's going to overflow like battery acid starts coming out. Right. That's kind of how the body is. That's what it feels like. If you don't put forth some effort and expend that energy, like it just starts boiling over. Mm-hmm. I know it does for me, man. If I don't get outside, if I don't run, if I don't exercise, it's not good. Yeah. Another another thing that it does is it reduces inflammation. I'm just going to go through some of these. Sure. Just uh, hit them all. Yeah. It helps eliminate fatigue. So a study found that people's mental inter- energy, mental energy bounced back even when they looked at pictures of nature. Mm. Isn't that interesting? Wow. I don't know. Interesting. I, I will, hey, they studied it, so. Uh, yeah, right. <laughs> I, again, I had, look, I'm not going to like be citing all of these studies. Which but Harvard I, reviewed it? I will study? post the link to the, to the article so you can look into it for yourself. But it may also fight depression and anxiety. That's okay. another one of those kind of just like duh things, but then you can't really exactly point to why. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But I, I tend to think that, that it's just such a, uh, a less distractions. You know, there's well, no... Um, there's no copy that I'm reading. There's no marketing that I'm looking at that I would be in the city. There's yeah. Well, and with, yeah, when you're just with yourself too, there's all this like internal stuff going on and it just like cycles on itself. But getting outside again just gets you, gets your brain moving in a different direction. Right. Here's one that was really interesting to me. A study showed that it may have a protective effect on the eyes and reduce the risk of developing nearsightedness. Interesting. They you're did, tracking things further away or something? I don't know. I, I think that maybe it's because if you're inside, you're always looking at things that are right in front of mm-hmm, you. And if mm-hmm. you're outside, you have like more of a grand view. Yeah. Yeah. I, I guess you're trying it. to track things that are further away. So it's like more 
cl- you're you're changing that direction more frequently. Yeah, you're working those eyes out. Yeah, yeah, I believe it. I'm okay, in. so hey, there. I mean, you have to, Josh. There was a study <laughs> on it. Okay, on the there's there's nothing. There's not a debate here. Uh, spending time outside lowers your blood pressure. Uh, that's another duh thing. Uh, it may help your ability to focus. Uh, they found that kids with ADHD, they've been found to concentrate better after just 20 minutes in the park. That's one of the huge <laughs> does for me because I'm yeah. like the total advocate of um, let's not put our kids in school all day at a desk. Yeah, if you've um, ever tried to get a kid to sit still for yeah. eight hours in like a seat, it just doesn't work yeah, out, I'm, right? They got to run around. Another one of my bullets here just says kids. Yeah. And that is huge forcing your kid yes forcing your kids to go outside and run around and burn that energy they're they're, they're like dogs like if you don't <laughs> run them if you don't run those kids they're gonna drive you nuts in the house yeah. and they're gonna tear your house up that's true you know pee on the floor all right you may perform better with creative tasks another study found that people immersed in nature for four days boosted their performance on a creative problem solving test by 50 percent. that's big yeah. That's a lot of improvement. I think, again, it just goes back to that. You're just kind of that um, solitude factor and you're just being able to process things that you wouldn't normally process because you have so many other distractions. So it probably has way more to do with just the solitude factor than it does yeah. the nature aspect just of it. Just calming but. your brain down because yeah. we are so, again, another note was solitude on, on my list. We're so busy. We got notifications on our phone. We pick up our phones. What's the stat? Two hundred times a day or something. When you when you put all that away, your your creative brain really gets a chance to activate instead of you preoccupying it all the time. Yeah, and a lot of you guys listening to this show, you're you're just thinking, yeah, duh, duh, I get it, right? Why are you talking about this? But it, it's something about reminding us because I'll listen to podcasts on stuff that I kind of already know a little bit, but it kind of reminds me, and it's kind of that gut check of like to evaluate you know, how I'm thinking about something. And so that's kind of a little bit about what we're doing right now. Now, for me, like I get into the daily grind and you lose sight of, you know, why this kind of thing is important. But for me, it is a requirement. I have to get outside and I have to do stuff or else I just my body, it doesn't function right. My brain doesn't work right. I start going crazy. I mean, I have to get out there. Yeah. Recently, I was telling the guys before we started recording tonight, uh, super hot in Georgia right now, obviously the last bit of summer here, and it's usually the hottest. I love the heat. Everybody thinks I'm crazy for it. But recently, and just like the middle of the day, I'll just take my chair outside and just sit and look up at the trees. You're like an old like, lady sunbathing outside like in the middle minutes. of... Well, it's, it, I don't do it in the direct sun. I'm, I'm kind of in the shade, okay. but... But you need that heat. Just sitting in the heat. And I'm seriously thinking to myself, I I need to do this because in a couple months it's going to be cold. It is going to be I hate cold. the cold. I yeah. hate the cold. So I'm just kind of soaking it all in. Yeah, yeah, that reminds me of, and we before the show were mentioning um, saunas. And, and there's a lot of science around saunas. And again, our buddy Joe Rogan, uh, big sauna advocate. But there's something about getting yourself superheated and like sweating just a little bit naturally. And that does all kinds of benefits. For or super cold, maybe you were saying. Yeah, that like- there's like cryotherapies. So you can do the opposite. But yeah, when you're putting your body in, in extremes, you're, you're causing all of these different chemicals to, to come up, which in our biological history, we were exposed to much more often. Our, our bodies, even, I mean, go back to the 40s, like we were exposed to way more cold extremes, talk to soldiers who were in Korea or World War II, depending on where they were. Um, stationed like super extreme cold, super extreme heat. People just dealt with that. It was more. It was more part of their life. Yeah, but we're also living longer now, so maybe yeah. maybe the air conditioning Except is doing us for good. Last year when we started going down, you did mention that we're so fat, and that we're is disappointing. Yeah. <laughs> I have a friend that's uh, from Finland, and they say sauna, sauna, hmm. sauna. It's like a southern, a really southern American person. That's what would it sounds say, like. It sounds like that, but that's how they pronounce it in. What is it? Finnish? Okay. Sauna. Sauna? Like with a W? Sauna. 
That's what she said. Interesting. I thought that was funny. I need to hear it. <laughs> Anyways, okay. Uh, last two here. May help prevent cancer. This one I was kind of like, yeah, really? I think there's, there's probably some... like a chain, you know, like a, a cascade effect to that, right? So, Well, like, it said that there's these certain um, proteins, I think, or yeah. something. It may stimulate the production of anti- anti-cancer proteins. I, I believe that. Certain sun exposure is like good for you. Like if you don't expose yourself enough to sun, you can get a lot of deficiencies. And yeah, that's true. Yeah. Overexposure obviously has negative effects. Don't hang out in the direct sunlight all day long, right? Yes. But get outside. Yeah, boosts, boosts in the levels of these particular proteins uh, that people get from being in the woods. May Polypeptides. Last, may last up to seven days after their trip. Oh. Wow. So it has lasting effects. Look, it's powerful, okay? For sure. Yeah. Okay, let's take the remainder of our time to just kind of talk about our experiences camping. And I know you guys started camping when you were kids, like I did too, yes? Yeah. You don't know that. You don't know that about me. (laughs) Y'all grew up camping. When I was a kid, I did not like camping. I didn't like, I liked it for probably the first day. But then when you wake up, in the morning and you're all sweaty and you've been sweating all night and you're like, where's the shower? There's no shower. Uh, there, for me, there, soft. I was soft. soft there, well, there was a, a um, an acclimation period. Like I needed to get over that hump. It was like a two day thing. And once I was past that, I was good. <laughs> I was all, it's kind of like getting your sea legs. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. I can remember not liking going outside or, well, I should say going outside, um, camping where it was wilderness because I have memories uh, briars, uh, yeah, you know, thorns, yeah. thorns and stuff, uh, you know, hitting me in the face because, and now that I look back, I'm like, well, duh, I'm, I'm like at eye level with these. Well, yeah, things. nobody's going to like that. Yeah. Right? But now when you're an adult, you just step on them, right? <laughs> <laughs> but when you're a kid, they're like slapping you yeah, right you in the face. you can't be dealing that. Yeah. You know, and I, I can remember that. Uh, but I, I have fond memories of camping and my dad would take us camping a, you know, decent amount as uh, as kids and i loved it and that's carried on to today yeah we were huge campers uh, my grandparents owned a pop-up camper and between my cousin's family and my family there eventually ended up with 10 kids and so we would camp a lot uh, the pop-up camper obviously for the adults all the kids slept out in tents and we would just go for weekends at the lake uh, grandparents also had a boat which is the same boat I mentioned earlier, which my cousin Matt refurbished. And, uh, but yeah, camping was a big thing. I did Cub Scouts. My dad took his backpacking periodically. So, do you yeah. guys camp now in the summer, like as adults? Uh, I try not to. So, my son, I will, but no one will go with me. Well, my son will go. My four year old, for like the past probably three months, he thinks he wants to go. He's like, Daddy, I want to go camping. And I'm like, I'm like, bro, it is July. It's August. It, it's, I don't know I how just, to tell you this nicely. It's not going to happen right now. I just went not too long ago. It's not that bad. Honestly. It's hot. Man. But I like the heat. So there's yeah. that. Well, uh, uh, when it when it cools down a little bit, you got to get out there. Yeah. But our so our typical camping now, we we should probably describe it because let's disclose uh, it because we're going to get some. Yeah. Uh, some deserved uh Poking fun. Some backlash oh, on yeah. this. Yeah. Okay. So full disclosure, the camping that we do is almost not camping. It It is in the sense that we're getting outside. We are enjoying nature for sure. So we go to my family's land in Odessa Dale, Georgia. Yeah. And uh, there's not a whole lot there. I mean, no. there's really not a whole lot there. Pine trees. There's a paved we're, road now, and every time I drive on it, I'm uh, like, I know, it just, ah, just makes you r- sad. It, it's weren't. <laughs> you know what I mean? So when we first kind of started going there together about 20 years ago, the the main road that we got to the campsite on was was a dirt road. So we would immediately dirt, duh, not even gravel. Yeah, dirt road. So we would immediately go quote unquote mud, and you know, right Obviously. when we. Turn on there, you know, got stuck and everything. So there's fun, actually a picture of that on the Facebook group, there, which we'll mention. Yes, in the show. exactly. Uh, but we've been going to this same camping spot for 20 plus years, and is also the site of our annual Christmas tree burning, the tree burn, which is epic, and has been going on for I think I'm going to say about 13 years or so. Yeah, I think Does that longer about than right? that. Longer easy, than that. Easy. Yeah. Yeah. The most we've ever had was 76 Christmas trees. Yep. Yep. Yeah. So anyways, it, it's just been a, a really big part of our lives. We go, I mean, not as often now, but 
Anyways, getting, I, want you, I want you to clarify, though. You said it's not really camping. Why is yeah, it not camping? Sorry, Why I should have got camping? back to that. Yeah. So, for start, Because in my mind, I'm camp Now, okay. Here, here's the difference. I'll, I'll, I'll go ahead and differentiate. I have slept there in are, my car down there. I'll yes. say that. I don't do that anymore. Okay. Well, there, there's that's the difference. Like, there are some folks. I've, I've gone back and forth between yep. sleeping in my car or sleeping in an actual tent. And we have a mix every time we go. Some guys, I've slept in a hammock down there. Just a hammock between trees. Some guys do that. So there's different levels of camping. Now, we go to the Walmart up the street. The Walmarts. And bring back food. But we prepare hot dogs over the fire. Yeah. And there's some cooking of food that happens. But a lot of yeah. it is brought in. Well, here's there, are le- there are levels of camping, and we're not, we're not killing our food, right? We're not <laughs> yeah, doing that yes. for sure. Well, here's another aspect about it, too, that we're rarely gone And y'all need to remind your wives this, all right? (laughs) We are rarely gone more than 24 24 hours. hours. I've never been gone 24 hours. Well, I've probably been gone 24 hours. I've never been gone more than that, right? Yeah. So we go down there. We're leaving. It's a day. It's it's one day. I I actually have recently been going more than 24 hours because I'll go down there early. I I actually bring my John Deere mower. I will bring it down to the campsite. We have this kind of large... Uh, open field essentially mm-hmm. surrounded by woods and so we'll usually kind of camp right in the center of that and obviously the grass gets high and so i'll bring my riding mower down there and i'll cut the grass you're welcome guys <laughs> and it it, 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 nice. it cuts honestly it cuts down on the bugs if you know yeah. i mean it drastically reduces the amount of bugs that are around so it's just actually a really pleasant experience the last time i went i really didn't experience hardly any bugs and this was like the middle of georgia summer well i just thought that that field like grass just didn't grow in it i'm like man it's always really nice down here (laughs) because i always always get there after tim's code (laughs) it smells great too yeah so most of the time when we go i'm just sleeping in my car I've got the air mattress it's nice guys i mean i was going to mention too that if being uncomfortable is keeping you from camping, look, just just get the air mattress. You got to get over it, right? Just, you know, make yourself comfortable because it's worth overcoming those barriers. Don't don't get in your head that you have to you have to be absolutely roughing it to go camping. I think it's better if you just kind of give yourself some creature comforts mm-hmm. and get out there and do it. I remember years ago, I would just lay a tarp on the ground and just sleep next to the fire, then, I, I don't know, I guess I just didn't even think anything well, of it. It was fine. You didn't but get sleep injuries like we do now. <laughs> yeah, I'm not I'm not doing that. I haven't ever slept out under the stars. I used to sleep in my car, but I'm six foot five, and I can't do that anymore, okay? I'm, I'm an adult, and I can't fold my... I used to, I guess, just be able to fold myself up, and then I'd wake up the next morning and be totally fine. That's not how it goes now. So I'll sleep in a tent, and this last year, it was really, really cold, and I actually brought... A propane heater, and it oh, yeah. saved my life. So, to Tim's point, bringing a little bit of creature comforts, it's not a terrible thing. Yeah, and, and you may be also thinking, too, like, oh, well, you got, like, some family land that you go to or whatever. Yeah, I am very fortunate for that. Look, it's it, I'm telling you, it's not much. <laughs> There's not much there at all. Uh, but there is so much uh, federal land and state land out there that yeah. you've look. There is no excuse. There is so much, be- way more beautiful land than than we go to. Uh, that are state parks and federal parks that you can totally take advantage of and use use those. Hey, you're already paying for it, right, with your taxes, and so take advantage of that for sure. Um, I was going to mention, you know, we've collectively we've talked about buying our own land so i don't own that family land it's you know it's not mine it's in the per- family it's in the family it's not mine personally um i just kind of have access to it but we've talked about having a i don't know what you want to call it you can man ranch or something compound that's compound. a dream yeah we'd have like a like a a common area that would be a building of some sort that I guess you could sleep in. Yeah, that's like, the ultimate dream. It's, yeah, it's a like a hunting a lodge. Maybe. Oh, in my mind, it's yeah. just like a lean-to. We yeah. just like put some boards up and we would start take shelter. Just camping in our cars. Yeah, here. and we've said that it has to have some body of water. It has to have a water source, yes. A what stream it, or ideally a lake. A Oof. stream, lake, yeah, something like that. But hey, man, if we ever do that, we will have a huge You Can Man party out Absolutely. there. Absolutely. Yep. So that's which prob- is a good segue into our Facebook group, exactly. Which is also a party, right? Yeah. 
Okay, so I recently, now by the time that this airs, we'll be a couple weeks out, I guess, from us actually starting the group. I think on the episode uh, 25 is when I kind of announced, okay, we're, we're just about to do it. And then I, was, I also mentioned, now it may be really small to start with, and I guess in terms of fitness. It is basically. really small. It's still technically really small, but we're actually really impressed. I think we have like, we're up to, as of this time that we're recording, we have like 180 members. We have under over like 400 something post counts. Posts and comments, yeah. Yeah, I think it counts like every time somebody likes something. But still, that's pretty significant. And I Less text, than a week, though. Yeah, right. I texted Josh and Dave, and it was probably, I don't know, day two of us starting the group. And I was like, I am genuinely surprised of how much uh, interaction we've gotten on on the group. It's been great. Yeah, what I really like is that there are a bunch of dudes on there that are way better at a lot of things than the three of us are. And that's like the beauty of the group. I mean, we we the three of us come to the table with our own things and you know, the spirit of the podcast and all that. But honestly, this group, there's been people helping each other out a ton. We've got an awesome discussion on security cameras where half of it's over my head. But there's dudes that are from all walks of life, all different levels of expertise, just helping each other out. Yeah, that's the cool part about is that community aspect that just was struck up immediately. Everybody's helping each other out. Uh, everybody's talking, everybody's sharing input. So if you haven't checked it out, check it out. There's a lot of good information. Yeah. And if you haven't uh, invited your friends, like if you're in the group, like you can invite all your friends. Right. It is like we're we're trying to make this as big as possible. Yeah, we did choose to make it a closed group. So it isn't a public group. So just so you know, whenever you are posting in the group, not everybody of your on your friends list on Facebook is seeing this. Yeah. It's only the members <clears throat> within the group. So you do need to invite people. And then we as the admins will we'll, we'll approve them, I guess, yeah. maybe. And we're going to, you know, if we get <clears throat> to a certain size, there'll be some ground rules we'll need to lay out. But everyone so far is just there for the you can man spirit and helping each other out and posting their projects and their sheds and their cat five, cat six wiring projects. It's really awesome. Yeah, for sure. That was a great thing because I, I was able to kind of weigh in on that and be like, yeah, I did that back in when we did our major renovations and all that stuff. So I was going to do some shout outs here. Do okay. It. Josh <laughs> with the uh, the security system stuff, which is cool because we were it's on the on our list of show topics. And so that was kind of cool that there's now a thread on our group about security yeah, systems. Multiple and cameras. guys chiming in on that one. That's yeah, cool. and I'm reading this stuff and I'm like, I have no idea what you guys are talking <laughs> about. Because I, I have I know next to nothing about security systems and yeah. all that kind of stuff. And so that was really cool. I did have to introduce Dave to the group because he hasn't posted in uh, on social media since 2009. So <laughs> look, it's a personal code of conduct that I don't operate on social media. I have broken that code of conduct for the You Can Man Facebook page, and you know we're all honored by. Your I'm presence. not looking back. All right, I love it's it's a great place to be. Um, so check it out. All right, we've got Philip. <laughs> He posted some pictures of a of a wall he's building. Yeah, looks pretty cool. Mount he's Jasper. doing a he's doing a concrete block wall. Uh, CMU wall, but uh, he's, he's facing, he's facing it. With stone. it. He's yeah. facing it with stone, and uh, then Andrew <laughs> is the one with the Cat Five. Yeah, for his office. I guess it's a home office. I don't know. Yeah, he yeah. Was, he was running the Cat Five. Like so he, I think he moved into a new house. I think. Okay, and he got all these sweet new tools too. Yeah, and I made a comment on on his post about. Now you've got the tools and the know-how to help somebody else right. outdo this. So, um, Andrew, if you're listening, you know, and you read my comment, you need to think of somebody that, action, bro. that you could help out, uh, help them do the same thing. Uh, Michael. Oh. oh, man, my good buddy, Michael. So he talked about um, hanging some shelves. It was just kind of a stupid post that he <laughs> did. but uh, uh, I chimed asking, in on that. Yeah, asking people, you know, how to do it to where it wouldn't fall on somebody's head. But, hey, it's a legitimate question. So thanks, Michael, for that. And then uh, my good friend, Brandon, oh. uh, he talked about getting his uh, smoke detectors because he was reminded – from listening to our episode, what was that, 24, Fire yep. Drill? Yep. Anyways, so just wanted to give some shout-outs there and 
guys, thanks so much for Joining participating. Yeah. So hopefully this will become a regular thing and we'll do some more shout outs and we'd love to see your projects and we'd love for everybody to give input on those projects. And again, if you have any questions whatsoever, that's a perfect outlet to do it. I was going to mention too, if you're like Dave and you're kind of gotten like, you know, anti-social media or anti-Facebook at least. Yeah. I mean, maybe you have a profile and you just hadn't gone on there in a long time. You have an account. Sorry, I should say you can log on and only do the Facebook group or the You Can Man group if you want to. It's a closed group, so it doesn't broadcast to the whole Internet. Exactly. So if you want to participate, you can still do it. All right. We're going to take a quick break. And when we get back, Josh has a segment. This episode is sponsored by 1776 United. 1776 United is a patriotic and historically inspired lifestyle brand. They make the best patriotic shirts and apparel on the market today. I personally own many of their products, and if you want to don patriotic gear without looking gaudy, check them out on Instagram, Facebook, and at 1776united.com. All right, guys, welcome back. Josh has the bonus segment this week. It's a normal thing that we do. We have no idea what he's going to say. A lot of times it has nothing to do with what we just talked about. Josh, take it away. Yeah, so my segment this week is pretty simple. It's going to be called The Loudest Sound Ever Heard. There's a lot of ways to measure sound, and there's a lot of uh, science involved and you may have seen a decibel chart about, you know, jackhammers are this loud and an airplane taking off is this loud. This sound technically might not be the loudest sound ever, but it has the coolest story. I am extremely interested to hear what that is. But yes. first, if I may have the floor, a quick story. I once asked you, I wonder who the loudest clapper in the world <laughs> is. And you said... That's me. <laughs> <laughs> really? Yeah. I need to get Guinness on that. Yeah, I'd like to know. Uh, so this is going to be a story about uh, something you've probably heard of. And it's a volcano or a volcanic island called Krakatoa. Krakatoa? Krakatoa. You probably heard Krakatoa. Nope. So back in 1883, August of 1883, so we're you know just past the anniversary, August 27th, the earth erupted. And blew the island of Krakatoa into basically non-existence. For the listeners out there and me who don't know where Krakatoa is. It is in Indonesia. Okay. I was thinking somewhere in the Pacific. So, yeah, one of those Pacific islands. Um, So this sound, when it went off at at 10.02 a.m. Now, this sounds like a long time ago. It does. And that's why. How do they know? How do they know how loud it was? They did have sophisticated instrumentation. They had eyewitnesses. um, Barometers is a way to measure pressure. And so that's how a lot of this information is coming to light. Basically, this volcano erupts. And it was heard 1,300 miles away (laughs) in some other islands. Um, And these are people that are documenting, like, in their diaries. Like, people used to write everything down um, outside of the Internet. 2,000 miles away in New Guinea and Western Australia, uh, a series of loud reports resembling those of artillery in a northwesterly direction were heard. So people in Western, Western Australia were hearing what they thought was gunfire around that time. Does it have day. anything to do with it being an island and sound traveling probably better over water? Yeah, probably. It has a clear shot. That makes sense. Um, but it was even more powerful mm-hmm. than that of just reaching Australia. It was heard 3,000 miles away in the Indian Ocean coming, and the sound was, quote, coming from the east like a distant roar of heavy guns. Uh, was one of the quotes from the time. So all in all, it was heard by people in over 50 different geographical locations. So people in 50 different places all over the world wrote down something or recorded something related to this incident. Yeah, how do they how do they tile that together? Is everyone like, you know, dear diary? Basically, yeah. What was that? And then, yeah. And so the people that were closest actually knew what had happened yeah. if they weren't and, wiped out instantly. And more people were paying attention to the stuff that's going 
on around them instead it, that of having is a absolutely at a phone. true. Yes. Yeah, if two guys, I mean, it may have taken weeks, but yeah, if two guys in two different towns were like, hey, like three weeks ago, I heard this thing, and the other guy was Me like, I too. totally heard something. Yeah, they start putting all that and, together. And way less uh, other distractions as far as like car noises and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, so that happened on the other side of the globe. So the, the scale might be a little weird, but if you think about someone in Boston saying, I heard an explosion that happened in New York. Yep. That's like 200 miles, but you'd still be like, oh my gosh, that's huge. That's only 200 miles. This would have been more like someone in Boston hearing an explosion that happened in Ireland. <laughs> okay. That's the kind of distances we're talking hey. about. So the speed at this thing was traveling, the speed of sound, uh, it erupted. It shot projectiles into the atmosphere at twice the speed of sound. Um, wow. Just an incredible, incredible explosion. Uh, and the really interesting, crazy part, one thing is it caused a tsunami, like these things often do. Tsunami was over 100 feet high. No. 100 foot high wave. Uh, 165 coastal villages were just swept away entirely. And, and the Dutch controlled a lot of or most of Indonesia at the time. Estimated death toll, 36,000. Some estimates are over 100,000. So not really good at keeping a body count back then. But So this is the loudest sound ever. Is this the loudest volcanic eruption ever? Do we know? That we know Feels like of, it should be, yeah, right? That we know of. So again, I'll get into later a little different ways of measuring. Oh, but please it's do. kind of the, like the loudest event um, heard by the most people, basically, around the world. A British ship that was 40 miles from the volcano at the time, the, the ship's captain wrote down in his log, quote, so violent are the explosions. And these were multiple explosions. It just wasn't one. Um, there was probably one giant explosion and then multiple Several. aftershocks, whatever the volcanic term for that is. Anyway, so violent are the explosions that the eardrums of over half of my crew have been ruptured. Wow. My last thoughts are with my dear wife. I am convinced the day of judgment has come. Whoa. I imagine if you if you hear a noise like that, it recalibrates your thinking. You know yeah. what I mean? Like re things just what? He's on a ship. And half of his crew's ears just bleed. Like, that's, Yikes. that's how and that And then goes. he was about to experience the tsunami. Yeah, yeah. And I don't even know. I couldn't find if, like, that ship survived or not. Uh, 40 miles out, I don't know how far out. If I'm guessing it's If you're not. on the ocean, though, and a tsunami happens, it's more of like a big... Uh, just it's a, a swell, right? In the it's deeper the water, the, the, the lower the swell. Yeah. yeah. It's, it, it's really only if you're on shore. We all yes. grew up on the water, so <laughs> we... But that is scientifically how it works. Okay. When a wave comes into shore, into shallower water, it gets yes. taller. Uh, there's probably hydrodynamics involved. I think I could sort of get into Sketch it, that but it'd be, it wouldn't be good. Uh, so there, the estimate uh, based on barometers, there was a barometer 100 miles away that registered a spike in over, with over 2.5 inches of mercury, which would convert to 172 decibels of sound pressure, Whoa. which is like an unimaginable noise uh, if, for instance, if you're next to the Saturn V rocket taking off, that's like 200 decibels. Uh, and this thing 100 miles away was 172 decibels. Wow. Um, hey. A jackhammer, if you're running a jackhammer with no head, no ear protection, that's 100 decibels. And I believe that's it's an exponential curve, right? Yeah, so it gets, if the louder it gets, like it just gets... Yep. You know, immeasurably, so not immeasurably, but much, much It's a louder. great point. At 130 decibels, that's when you start feeling pain uh, in your ear. And yeah. So 170 is when you just vaporize, basically? Well, it hurts. It hurts bad. Uh, 150 is yet next to a jet engine. Um, so yeah, 172 decibels at 100 miles away. Oof. Incredibly loud. Um, lots of sound pressure waves involved. 3,000 miles away. The pressure grew too quiet for human eardrums to hear, but there was still a pressure being sent across the planet, if that makes sense. Yeah. So this thing went around the Earth for five days. <laughs> the sound, like the pressure wave? Yes, the sound. Uh, by 18 hours, the pulse reached New York, Washington, D.C., and Toronto. 
And then, yeah, after five days, about every 34 hours, a reoccurring pressure wave would get picked up by these barometers all over the world. What if it's still going mm, and we just mm, don't mm, know? Maybe. Okay, guys. Maybe. It's we'll never stop. Maybe. So we'll post a, a couple of videos. So that's kind of, I mean, that's it. It was a huge, huge explosion. There's some more recent videos, one actually in the past week of a volcano erupting. There wasn't like a crazy sound wave, but... It's a video. Did you see this? Like the guy's in the boat off yes. the island. He's like motoring away from yeah. this huge ash plume that's coming. Oh, I did see that. Yeah. Whoa. Um, and then, yeah, Papua New Guinea um, on the internet. If you look that one up, it went off a few years ago. And you, in the can, ring of fire, you can see the explosion happen. And then a couple seconds later, just the crack of the. Uh, I'll tell you what, that's one thing I, I don't need to experience that. Yeah, so a pretty, pretty incredible item. Again, like some other sounds, a Saturn V rocket, 204, but that's like next to it. You know, that's right up close and personal. Another sound that scientists talk about, which wasn't really heard, but it was measured again with pressure, was in 2013, a meteor uh, erupted over southern Russia. Some sensors picked up the infra infrasound which means we can't hear it i think basically okay yeah it's sound that we can't hear which makes sense for people that are smart not like me clearly nine thousand miles away these sensors picked up wow. this this wow. uh meteor exploding over southern russia the nearest sensor was 435 miles away where the decibel di- decibel level did reach 90 uh, 435 miles away, but it didn't even explode on the ground. It was like up in the air. And apparently it was where no, not a lot of people were. Yeah. So. Didn't it like blow a forest over or something? Yeah. I don't know if this is the same one, but I'm assuming this is the one that passed over where it was like shattering glass yes. out of factories and stuff yeah. as it went over. Wild stuff. Dude, I really actually love that. That was a good I, segment. I've heard the name Krakatoa, yeah. but I never knew that's what it means about the sound. Really? Crazy loud, eighteen eighty three. Awesome, good deal. All right, that's going to wrap up this week's show, guys. Check out the Facebook group that we talked about earlier. It's rocking. It, it really is. I posted at the time of this recording earlier today about weed killers, and all these people chimed in. There's a ton of experts out there that yeah. have more expert knowledge on certain things than we do, which is awesome. Which is why we created the group. Yeah, I gotta get schooled a little bit on. Uh, I'm, I'm going to miss fin- no, 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 no. Glyphos- glyphosate. Glyphosate. Yeah. Mm. Glyphosate. Glyph- glyphosate something. Yeah. Anyways, uh, check that out. Check out our show notes at ukmain.com, and we will catch you next time. Bye. 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 Bye.